Hello there and welcome to City Line. We are zooming from my kitchen into your home and it's wonderful to be with you. We have a great hour ahead of us. Later on, we'll be talking with the Tacoma Historical Society, Bill Barsma and Kim Davenport are here to talk about some of the virtual events um, that you want to tune in for because uh, there's some great surprises they have for us and I won't give that away. Workforce Central, Tamar Jackson, who is the Director of Community Engagement is here to talk about what he has been doing since he sat on our comfy couch uh, about almost a year ago, it feels like. Um, and then, of course, we have Kevin Glacken Cooley. He's here to talk about Tacoma Pierce County Coalition to End Homelessness. They just had a great summit, and uh, he's here to report out on that and what you can do to be a part of the solution. Uh, to end homelessness. Our pet of the week is here from the Tacoma Pierce County Humane Society. Uh, we'll have uh, Julia here to talk about who needs a forever home. And with me is somebody who I love and adore. I don't get to spend a whole lot of time with her, but her presence is felt in my life weekly, if not every other day, because she's always making news and of course doing everything she can to take care of our children here in Tacoma. I'm talking about the superintendent of Tacoma Public Schools, Carla Santorno. Hello, Carla. Hi, how are you, Amanda? Good to see you. I am well, my dear. How are you? Hey, I am good. <laughs> Coming on a holiday break, I'm looking forward to. So I, I'm gonna get to spend some time with my delightful grandson. So I am good. I love that. You, you are a very, very busy woman. So I thank you so much for taking time out to be with us. So um, let's get right to it. This past week, uh, it was announced that Tacoma Public Schools would be bringing students back for in-person learning. I'm going to say that one more time, in-person learning in January. So can you explain to, to me and to all of our parents who are watching, what will that look like? Thanks, Amanda. Um, I want to start with letting uh, people know, you know, I, I, it's not that our group or the uh, TPS works up in the morning and says, hey, let's get, get kids in school. <laughs> you know, I just want to reemphasize that we really pay attention to the guidance from the health department. We are totally listening to the governor. You know, sometimes people know it before we do because they listen to the governor. And, you know, just recent two weeks ago, I think the governor was on uh, gave us report and said, hey, we it looks like the uh, indicators are that we can start kids in one to one, you know, on face-to-face uh, -face instruction. So if you think back in March, we closed schools when the numbers were uh, much lower than they are now. So what's happened, you know, and why do is it okay for kids to go to school now? And um, I I am not an epidemiologist, I am not a doctor. <laughs> You know, I'm not the person who demographer that looks across all the state, all the schools in all the different states. I've talked to superintendents from across the country. And so I hear, you know, what they're doing and what they're trying to do. So all that to introduce that, you know, what the science is telling us and what the uh, statistics and data is saying is that our youngest learners are least likely to contract the disease or spread the disease. And that when you when you, you take the difference between a young first grader, uh, you know, trying to learn to read and doing it remotely with the computer <laughs> and finding out that really, um, that there's nothing to back that they are in, you know, supreme danger, then it just makes sense to get them back to school. We're going to be cautious. So what we announced um, on uh, last Friday is that right now, we are anticipating bringing back kindergartners for face-to-face -face instruction on January 19th. We wanted to give parents an opportunity to kind of get used to that idea. We're talking about a hybrid model. So if you remember, Amanda, back when I was on your program, we were talking about starting in the hybrid model in September. And the hybrid model is taking our, you know, is taking our kindergartners and uh, starting them in an A and a B group. So a group of A's and a group of B's and uh, having the teachers, you know, alternate uh, taking them. So it's a hybrid model, which means that uh, part of their time would be in remote. Now, what we found that is that we could accommodate, we have enough classroom space to accommodate 
our kindergartners come in four days a week. And that is good, good news. But I want to hear that, hear that big but. We're going to start them off two days a week. Why? We all know what the first day of school looks like with kindergartners. And uh, we've heard all kinds of cute uh, terms, like to keep them socially distanced. They've got to learn to do the zombie walk so that they stay apart from each other. So we have all kinds of protocols and routines for our kindergartners to learn. They've had their kindergarten teacher, but now they're gonna see her face to face. She's still gonna have a mask on, um, but we're looking, our kindergarten teachers are looking forward to having their youngsters in their classroom. And in the beginning, we'll do two days a week so they can teach you know, uh, we, we, you know we, we have to make it safe. I, you know, we're not abandoning all the rules. The kids have to be masked. We need a parent attestation. And if your parents haven't gone online and filled out that attestation form so that they know uh, that they can check that, hey, my kid doesn't have a fever. He hasn't been exposed to anybody with COVID. So you can take that, uh, take that daily attestation before you ever you know, put your student uh, on the bus or get them in class. We're still gonna be teaching, we still are gonna have kids sanitizing, where we have protocols for sanitizing the classroom. We have protocols for case tracking. So we know who, you know, who's getting it or who has it or who has an uncle that has COVID so that we can track it. So we'll start with two days a week for the first two weeks of school. So that's the week of January 19th. I don't have my calendar in front of me. So the next Monday, 19th is a Tuesday so that uh, we can get our teachers back and get them to have time, uh, plenty of time. And then the next Monday uh, is another week. So we'll get to see all of our kindergartners, but they'll be divided into an A, B group. So A on a Monday, Tuesday, then Thursday, Friday. So that Monday, that Monday is January 25th. Um, the next Monday? Next Monday. Okay, good, yeah. thank you. And then the week after that will be full time. Then once we see how that looks and how it works and how it's going, then we can bring in our first graders, and we're thinking about bringing first and second graders back. We'll have that expertise. We've worked very closely with our very closely with our teachers. Very closely, you know, we want everybody to feel safe and secure when they come in. Based on the evidence that we have from around the country, we believe that it is safe to bring in these earliest learners. Now, you know, we want your public. We want our public to know too. Our community to know. Just today, we talked. Uh, with a community, a, a community member who is uh, wants to do a pilot with us to see about uh, vaccinations, and maybe we, you know, we've applied maybe to start this vaccination program so uh, of our adults, so that maybe we can, you know, uh, get a leg on that. We also want to make, you know, there's some testing protocols going on in three districts uh, that are smaller than us, but we want to get on that. Anything we can do to guarantee and foster a safe environment for our youngsters uh, will be good, but we want them in school. We believe that the influence their teachers can have on them face-to-face -face is incredible and that we have they have a right. I've been in some of those classrooms and uh, our teachers are ready. <laughs> their, their classrooms look beautiful, shout out. Shout outs to the kindergarten rooms I've been in. Uh, their teachers have worked miracles. It's not going to be easy because six feet apart in a you know in a desk is not easy. But I've also been on on team calls where you've got 25 squirrely 25 or 20 squirrely bodies on that TV screen and asking them to get out from under a bed and put away the bunnies and all of those things. And so um, I think it's going to be good. I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I think you're right. There is that social ingredient that those little miracles need to be a part of. And a screen right. should not be, in the best case scenario, part of that education. Now, let's talk about what about students, Carla, who receive special education services? Oh, good, good. Thank you. So, you know, we already have over 700 students that are receiving face-to-face -face instruction right now. And they're, they're our uh, students that have students with disabilities that are in self-contained uh, rooms. And we'll continue that. And again, uh, we, now that the guidelines say that you can have, used to be we could only have a safe group was five students. And now with the new guidelines, we can take it, it uh, when it gets down, when it gets down to 350, we're above that right now. But when it gets to 350, we can have groups up to 15 
And so again, socially distanced, um, sanitized, wearing masks, all those safeties. So what that means is that we can add a, a population of uh, students with disabilities and uh, specialized students from secondary. I didn't talk about the entry of, you know, uh, third through fifth and six through 12. And so the reason I didn't mention it is we have to see how these first grades go. We know that, um, you know, uh, the vaccinations aren't for our youngest children and for or for middle schoolers and that our high schoolers do can uh, catch the disease and can spread it. So we'll watch for further guidance about how we can enter those. So we believe that we can add more um, self-contained students in school with this new guideline of 15 and that we can add more secondary students. And we also wanna to put together now that when we get below 350, we're not there yet. When we get below 350, we can also add, you know, we're trying, right now I have a class that I watch at, a, at Mount Tahoma High School that are coming in to get stable internet. You know, they just need stable internet. And, um, you know, they're, they come in and I, I ask my little group, they, you know, basically they're regular uh, 14, 15, 16 year olds. They don't want to talk to me, okay? And I don't believe them. <laughs> but what I have been able to get them to say is, hey, is this better? And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, this is a better space for me, you know, to get this done. So we have lots more options with the new guidelines. And again, uh, you, we want to have an opportunity to put schools. I have uh, parents at home that are saying, no way. I don't want my baby to come to school. I'll go to online. You know, and we have over 3,000 students in an online platform. It has, it has a capacity, a volume capacity. So we can't guarantee everybody who wants to switch a space, but we want you to let us know if you need one and we'll give you guidelines about how to do that. Because we may have some people in online that say, hey, enough of this, I'm ready to go to one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the, uh, direct instruction. So I want the public to know that we, we hear you, we're work, you know, we are getting um, advice. We're talking to other districts. We have three districts that do have their students in class. And so they're smaller than we are, but we're able to get tips. We did, we learned about the zombie walk from them. And so, um, you know, we, we feel like we will have best safe practices in place. I love that. I love that. So I could spend hours with you and it seems like I only have a few minutes left. So I want to, I, I want to jump to something that is, uh, as we say, a hot topic and it's in today's headlines. And that is, uh, many of us in the community are hoping to see a new name for Wilson High School. Because of President Woodrow Wilson's support for the Ku Klux Klan, um, can you give us an update on that and where, where it stands and where are we? So we had an excellent committee that has worked on this um, for, I, I don't know, it's, it's up to th about around three months. They've sent out surveys, they've met, they gave a presentation to the board. So I will honestly say that that decision is in my court right now. What I have to do, and I don't make the final decision, the board does. But right now on my desk, I have the beginnings of the final report that I need to give to the board about, uh, you know, that the committee came up with changing the name. So I'm finding out costs. Um, you know, I, I, I remember a letter I got from a mom that said, are you kidding me? I just bought the letter jacket and then this and then that and then that. It has Wilson on it. Don't change that name. So, you know, we, we have to come up with a great timeline and we have to come up with, uh, you know, we want a, a feel for what the costs will be. And uh, there will be, you know, there will be a change at Wilson. Right now, the two main um, proposals are that uh, we name it Dolores Silas after a long time uh, Tacoma resident. And then uh, more of keeping the Wilson and dro dropping the Woodrow. My job is to make a recommendation and to use this uh, the data and things that I have. I'm doing final back, you know, searches on the numbers and things like that. I will give a recommendation to the board by their first board meeting in January, and then they will take it from there and make a final decision. So we're close. All right. And, and we'll be thoughtful about when we implement it. You know, we're not going to. It won't if it uh, if the name changes. And, and my guess is that. There will be a change. There will be some kind of a change. Uh, you know, we'll wait until we'll be thoughtful about the time changes so that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, and, and also we'll look at, you know, the same colors. My recommendation will say keep the colors, 
keep the mascot, you'll still be a ram. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> we'll be thoughtful about what the change looks like. So stay tuned. Um, my guess is that we'll have a decision late January, early February. Carla, I, I, have, I have so many more things to ask you, but I, I don't have the time. So that gives me an opportunity to have you back on the show, uh, hopefully in uh, February or March when we can talk about spring sports. Where are we at that point with COVID and graduation? So we'll just tuck those away for another time. I want to say thank you so much for what you do. Um, I, I, I have said it and I will say it for as long as I can say it. We could not have a better co-parent than Carla Santorno looking after our children and her whole team. So my dear, dear friend, thank you so much for being here today. Please thank get you. some rest, kiss Hello. that grandbaby until you can't kiss that grandbaby anymore. And Hello. happy holidays to you and yours, my dear. Thank you. Same to you, Amanda. Thanks for having me on. I love my job, so thanks. <laughs> it shows, and thank you.